Hi, everybody. My name is Aubrey. I'm a grateful recovering alcoholic. We're on page eight in Bill's story in the big book. And it's been quite a ride so far with Bill. You know, he started drinking just as at a party, had a couple of drinks, no big deal, went overseas, had a couple more drinks, came back, started drinking more through his businesses, and it got worse and worse and worse. Till one day he said, you know, liquor is not a luxury, it's a necessity. And that was bad enough, but he kept on drinking. And then one day, after quite a few years, he finally admitted alcohol was my master. And that's the time that he knew that he was beaten by alcohol. This inanimate object, alcohol, had gotten him and destroyed his life. So he was really messed up. And so he went to the hospital for the second time to the Towns Hospital in New York. He went there just a three-week stay when you go there for alcohol um, addiction, as they called it then. And he stayed in the hospital for three weeks, stayed sober a little bit after he got out of the hospital. But then, sure enough, Armistice Day in 1934, which was November 11th, 1934, that's an important date, which we will talk about later. So Armistice Day came and off he was again. He had another big run in with alcohol and he just got totally smashed and was drinking every day. And he knew that he was going to, you know, if he didn't quit, he was going to die from it. And then it says, in the last paragraph we read last week, it says, near the end of that bleak November. So he started drinking on November 11th. And so he drank through most of the month. He said, I sat in my kitchen with a certain satisfaction. I reflected there was enough gin concealed about the house to carry me through that night and the next day. So when you're so drunk and you're planning on just drinking for the rest, I mean, you stop in the middle of it and figure out your inventory of alcohol. Bill wanted to make sure he wanted to find if he had enough alcohol while he was already drunk, he wanted to make sure he had enough. So when he woke up in the morning, he had a bottle of gin to drink because he couldn't even get out of bed without a bottle of gin. So he, had, he was hiding his, his booze all over the house. And he goes, um, my wife is at work, and I wondered if I dared to hide a full bottle of gin near the head of our bed. I would need it before daylight. So he had a big plan. He goes, but my musing was interrupted by the telephone. The cheery voice of an old school friend asked if he might come over. He was sober. And that's written in italics. That's important in the big book. So he said he was sober. It was years since I could remember his coming to New York in that condition. So Bill is such a drunk that he considered being sober a condition. Not the other way. You know, the other way, we're sober all the time. If you see somebody that's drunk, you say, wow, they're in bad condition. Bill had it the opposite way. Being sober was a condition. That needed to be fixed. I was amazed. Rumor had it he had been committed for alcoholic insanity. I wondered how he had escaped. Back in those days, they locked people up for drinking, you know, for alcoholic insanity. If they were too bad, they get locked up. And you went to a court, and the court assigned you, you know, a, a sentence that was you needed to be put into an insane asylum, a state hospital. Until you got better. So it was an endless sentence. If you didn't get better, you stayed in there forever. If you got better and could talk your way into getting out, you might get out. But most people were sent there and stayed forever. So it's a quite a harsh penalty. And the big history part of this is Ebby Thatcher was the son of a politician in New York. His father was the mayor of Albany, New York. So his father's a mayor. They're well-to-do. They're high society. Father's the mayor. And here's Abby running around town getting drunk all over the place. So his father says, come on, you're embarrassing the family already. You know, every every time we hear about you, you're drunk somewhere. There's all kinds of a mess about it. You got to 
cut it out. He says, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to send you to our summer home in Vermont. You stay there by yourself, fix up the house, paint it, clean it up, get it ready, and then the whole family will come there this summer. So he said, okay. So he goes there, and he starts to paint the outside of the house. Now, he's drinking the whole time, so he's drunk out of his head. He's trying to paint the outside of the house, and there's pigeons on the roof. And the pigeons keep pooping on the wall that he's painting. So he keeps on trying to paint, and they keep on pooping. So finally, he gets pissed off as an alcoholic will. And he goes inside the house and gets a shotgun. And he comes out and he starts shooting at the pigeons. Well, the pigeons are on his house. And he's drunk. So shot a big hole up in the, in the eave on the roof. Shot holes in the side of his house, all over the side of his house. Wherever the bird flew down, he tried to shoot it in the air and blow holes in the side of his house. So the neighbors were freaking out. There's a drunk guy next door shooting holes in his house. So they called the police. Police came and arrested him and took him to court. And he was in that court getting ready to be sentenced for alcoholic insanity. And two guys walked in, a guy named Roland Hazard and another guy named Seabar Graves. And these two guys went in and petitioned the judge and said, could you please like release him in our custody? And we'll take care of him. We'll make sure he's safe and he doesn't do any other damage. So the judge says, okay, if you'll sponsor him out of here, he's in your protective care so you can take him and, you know, hope everything works out all, all right. So he got out of going to, to this hospital forever. But they called it sponsoring. And that's where the term sponsor came in our program is someone who's sober takes the drunk and sponsors him until he gets sober. And that's what we do now. So that was the beginning of the sponsorship. And Roland Hazard will show up again in the book. A very interesting story that he has. So we'll wait and read about that. And we'll tell you some more history about that. And the one thing about Roland Hazard that's important here is he was part of the Oxford group. Him and our Mr. Graves were part of the Oxford group. So they took Abby to the Oxford group. And, and it was a Christian group. And that helped get you sober. But and other things, you know, they got you in a Christian way of life. So that was cool. And he got it and everything was OK. So the, the, that history begins with the connection of AA to Oxford Group and Roland Hazard and his connection to uh, AA, along with Ebby Thatcher's connection. So all that happened at that period of time quite amazing. And that stuff is still with us today. So then he it goes on to say, of course, he would have dinner. And then I could drink openly with him. Unmindful of his welfare, I thought only of recapturing the spirit of other days. This is why we don't go to 12-step calls by ourselves. Abby went, Abby survived it. But Bill's thinking was this was an old drinking buddy and he's coming to dinner. So, okay, he said he's sober, but we're, we'll drink anyway. He was unmindful, therefore inconsiderate and kind of dismissive of the fact that Abby had gotten sober and he was tempting him with drinks. So, and wanted uh, his Bill's mind was here's my old buddy, my old drinker buddy. We're going to get good and drunk tonight. And Ebby's there trying to say, I'm sober and I have the answer for you. And Bill wasn't connecting to that. He said, There was a time we had chartered an airplane to complete a jag. His coming was an oasis in this dreary desert of futility. The very thing, an oasis. Drinkers are like that. So he thought for sure he was going to get Ebby to drink that night. It was like a deal. But Ebby wouldn't drink. So the guy comes to the door. The door opened and he stood there, fresh-skinned and glowing. There was something about his eyes. He was inexplicably different. What had happened? I pushed a drink across the table. He refused it. Disappointed but curious, I wondered, what had got into the fellow? 
He wasn't himself. Come, what's all this about? I queried. He looked straight at me, simply but smilingly. He said, I've got religion. I was aghast. So that was it. Last summer, an alcoholic crackpot. Now I suspected a little cracked about religion. He had that starry-eyed look. Yes, the old boy was on fire, all right. But bless his heart. Let him rant. Besides, my gin would last longer than his preaching. So Bill's attitude was not good. Bill was an atheist. As soon as the guy said, I found religion, Bill is like, oh, no. I'm going to have to listen to this guy preach to me all night long. And he just wasn't going to have it. Thought the guy was going to be ranting. And, and all he could think about is, well, I got enough gin, no matter how long he talks. I got enough gin to get me through it. And so it went on. And he says, but he did no ranting. In a matter-of-fact way, he told how two men had appeared in court persuading the judge to suspend his commitment. They had told of a simple religious idea and a practical program of action. That was two months ago, and the result was self-evident. It worked. Now, that, that program of action was that the Oxford group had four absolutes and six steps that you had to go through. And they were rough. Those six steps were rough. The four absolutes were impossible. Left you with it just always fighting to stay ahead in the Oxford group. It wasn't easy. And we'll talk about that later in the book, in the book too, about what those, those things were. So they had a program of action. It was just much, not 12 steps. It was only six steps. Ebby had gone through some of that stuff, and now he's going to try to pass that word on to Bill, if Bill would listen to him. So he said he had come to pass his experience along to me, if I cared to have it. I was shocked, but interested. Certainly I was interested. I had to be, for I was hopeless. So Bill was admitting again that he was powerless over alcohol, that his life is unmanageable, and he was in a hopeless and helpless situation. He said he talked for hours. Childhood memories rose before me. I could almost hear the sound of the preacher's voice as I sat on still Sundays way over there on the hillside. There was that proffered temperance pledge that I never signed. My grandfather's good-natured contempt for some church folk and their doings. His insistence that the spheres really had their music but his denial of the preacher's right to tell him how to listen. His fearlessness as he spoke of these things just before he died. These recollections welled up from the past, and they made me swallow hard. The wartime day in Old Winchester Cathedral came back again. With Abby trying to explain to Bill that this was a, a religious idea and a program of action. Bill started thinking, you know, maybe I was wrong. And, and he tells a little history there of, you know, he got all his ideas from his grandfather who raised him. Grandpa Griffin raised him when he was a kid. And his, his, his grandfather was a solid atheist who didn't like anything to do with the church and passed that on to Bill. And therefore, Bill didn't care anything about the church. And he, it was all about the physical part, the, the preacher's right to tell him how to listen. The preachers were telling you what was right and what was wrong. And his, his grandfather didn't believe in that stuff. So Bill had, as a kid, a blockage to believing in a power greater than himself. So it says, I had always believed in a power greater than myself. I had often pondered these things. I was not an atheist. Few people really are, for that means blind faith in the strange proposition that this universe originated in a cipher and aimlessly rushes nowhere. My intellectual heroes, the chemists, the astronomers, even the evolutionists, suggested vast laws and forces at work. Despite contrary indications, I had little doubt that a mighty purpose and rhythm underlie all. 
How could there be so much of precise and immutable law and no intelligence? I simply had to believe in a spirit of the universe who knew uh, neither time nor limitation, but that was as far as I had gone. So Bill allowed himself to have somewhat of an idea that there was some power out there, but the thing that he failed to get was that that power is personal to him if he wants it. But as we go through our steps and we find out that we have a higher power and we start looking at our higher power, we start to believe in our higher power, trust our higher power, depend on our higher power, we get a better conception of that. Bill stopped. He only believed what he believed, and then, boom, dead end. The gate shut. That was as far as he had gone. He says, with ministers and the world's religions, I parted right there. When they talked of God personal to me, who was love, superhuman strength, and direction, I became irritated, and my mind snapped shut against such a theory. So he wouldn't even entertain the idea of a God personal to him. Blank. Bam! Absolutely no open-mindedness and no willingness at this point. And then he goes, To Christ I conceded the certainty of a good man, not too closely followed by those who claimed him. His moral teaching most excellent. For myself, I had adopted those parts which seemed convenient and not too difficult. The rest I disregarded. So, What Bill did believe and what he did do on sort of a religious thing was pick out the stuff that he said was okay, that was easy to do, that was convenient, that didn't put any effort on his part. He picked those things, but anything that had any working to do or any faith to do, he just threw that away. He disregarded that. So he was a hard case. He was an agnostic, certainly not a believer. And then he goes on talking about things that happened in his life and his conceptions of what he saw life as at that point. He said, the wars which have been fought, the burnings and the chicanery that religious dispute had facilitated made me sick. So he blamed wars on religion. So he didn't like religion at all. I honestly doubted whether on balance the religions of mankind had done any good. Judging from what I had seen in Europe and since, The power of God in human affairs was negligible. The brotherhood of man, just a grim jest. If there was a devil, he seemed to be boss universal, and he certainly had me. Again, Bill just re-emphasizes the fact that he doesn't like religion at all, and that he didn't think religion was doing any good to anybody, and rejected it wholeheartedly as just useless and here's a guy sitting there talking to him trying to get him convinced that there is a higher power that is personal to him and that is the solution to his drinking problem and so he goes on but my friend sat before me and he made the point blank declaration that god had done for him what he could not do for himself his human will had failed Doctors had pronounced him incurable. Society was about to lock him up. Like myself, he had admitted complete defeat. Then he had, in effect, been raised from the dead, suddenly taken from the scrap heap to a level of life better than the best he had ever known. Bill recognized that something good had happened to Abby once he had this certain belief, this religious idea. And Bill also says he admitted complete defeat. So he was almost at the place where Ebby was, but Ebby got some, he got the new idea first. And Bill didn't have that idea yet. Ebby was about to hand it to him. So Bill was still in the dark, but he was admitting defeat. He is doing his first step continually, still doing his first step, admitted complete defeat. And then next, it talks about that power. Had his power originated in him? Obviously, it had not. There had been no more power in him than there was in me at that minute, and that was none at all. So Bill 
in that statement says, I am powerless. I had no power in me. And Ebby didn't either when he first came to believe this religious idea. Ebby had no power. It didn't come from inside of them. It came from outside. He said, that floored me. It began to look as though religious people were right after all. Here was something at work in human in the human heart which had done the impossible. My ideas about miracles were drastically revised right then. Never mind the musty past. Here sat a miracle directly across the kitchen table. He shouted great tidings. So Bill is coming out of this fog. He's starting to realize that what Eddie's doing is a miracle. This was his old drinking buddy. They had gotten in all kinds of scrapes before. And now this guy is stone cold sober telling Bill about it. And Bill had to open his eyes to it. He said, I saw my friend was much more than inwardly recognized. He was on a different footing. His roots grasp new soil, a new beginning. His friend had been replanted in better soil. He had a better source of life and energy where he was that Bill hadn't found yet. So then it goes on. He says, despite the living example of my friend there remained in me the vestiges of my old prejudice. The word God still aroused a certain antipathy. When the thought was expressed that there, were, that there might be a God personal to me, this feeling was intensified. I didn't like the idea. I could go for such conceptions as a creative intelligence, a universal mind, or spirit of nature. But I resisted the thought of a czar of the heavens, however loving his sway may be. I have since talked with scores of men who felt the same way. So Bill is still saying, I just can't kind of get this God you're talking about. It's not. I can't believe there's such a thing as a personal God to me. And then Ebby said the sentence that changed it all. My friend suggested what then seemed a novel idea. He said, why don't you choose your own conception of God? Wow, that was different. That statement hit me hard. It melted the icy intellectual mountain in whose shadow I had lived and shivered many years. I stood in the sunlight at last. Bill got the idea. The idea hit him right then and there. He said, and this is in italics again. Writing in italics in the big book is always important. He said, it was only a matter of being willing to believe in a power greater than myself. Nothing more was required for me to make my beginning. I saw that growth could start from that point. Upon a foundation of complete willingness, I might build what I saw in my friend. Would I have it? Of course I would. The bill accepts that conception. He accepts the idea of a God of your own understanding. He says, thus I was convinced that God is concerned with us humans when we want him enough. At long last, I saw, I felt, I believed. Scales of pride and prejudice fell from my eyes. A new world came into view. The real significance of my experience in the cathedral burst upon me for a brief moment. I had needed and wanted God. There had been a humble willingness to have him with me, and he came. But soon the sense of his presence had been blotted out by worldly clamors, mostly those within myself, and so it had been ever since. How blind I had been. So when we read that part in the very beginning on the first page of Bill's story, when he reads that little poem off that tombstone in the, in the cathedral, 
It hit him then, but he didn't pay attention. He drank anyway. But that was a moment. He was overseas. He was kind of alone. The guys in his company were around, but, you know, he's just wandering around. And he was alone, even in a crowd of people. He was by himself. There was nobody else there that cared for him. And he needed something. And what he needed was God. And, and he admitted at this point that at that moment, he needed and wanted God, but couldn't have him. Because other things got in his way, and he forgot about it. So Bill had realized the mistakes he had made in the past. He hadn't signed that statement. You know, they used to have this proffering statement where you you decided not to drink and you signed an oath that you would not drink. And he never signed it. And he remembered it and it bothered him because he was now drunk. He was, you know, he sees what they meant. So he wasn't feeling good because of that. So next it says, at the hospital, I was separated from alcohol for the last time. Treatment seemed wise, for I showed signs of delirious tremens. All right. So, built in the hospital for the third time now, taken there by Abby Thatcher. He's in the hospital. And these conversations were more than one conversation. Bill ended up passing out the night he went for dinner. He passed out, and Evie talked to Lois for hours. But Evie was, I mean, Bill was passed out drunk and went to bed. But Lois is very interested in an idea that would get her husband sober. So she listened to Evie. Then they took him to the hospital, and they went to see him in the hospital. I talked to him in the hospital. Then they left, and they came back and talked to him again. So this took a period of time. But he got separated from alcohol when he went into the hospital for the last time. So upon entering the hospital, no more drinks. That was December 11th, 1934. That's Bill's sober date. So it's one month on his last debauch, as he calls it. On November 11th, he went out and got drunk. On December 11th, he was removed from alcohol forever. So it took him a month, one more month of just sheer alcoholism to get him into the hospital. Now, he was still drunk. He was still hungover. He stayed in the hospital for three more weeks. Uh, but he, he didn't have a drink. And when he came out of the hospital this time, he stayed sober. So we're going to see what happens to him after that fact, after that moment that he separated from alcohol for the last time. What happened next? Next week, we'll cover that. We'll read Bill doing the next few things that he did in his life in this program of action and this religious idea and program of action. And we'll, we'll look at what he did. And you can see the similarities in that. Remember, when he did those things, when, what we're going to read next week, there were no steps written at the time. Bill hadn't written the 12 steps. So this is just what his actions were in a rudimentary function. When he was separated from alcohol. And it's amazing. It's an amazing story. So we'll pick up there next week. Thank you all for listening. I really enjoy it. And I will see you next week. Back to you, Barbara.